Welcome everyone to today's lecture. Um, we are now at chapter three, central banks and central banking. And because this is an introduction to banking, um, even though we most of the time will deal with commercial banks and investment banks, uh, we still need to know a little bit um, about the basics of central banking because this is um, um, a very important point where banks and the banking sector will differ from other industrial sectors because they interact with central banks, they have a direct linkage um, with economic policy and monetary policy and this is why uh, central banking. So we'll talk about uh, the basics of central banks and um, also the basics of financial regulation and financial supervision. Although, as you can see, we'll come back to this point here in Chapter 7 um, when we go into more detail of bank regulation. But we'll start uh, here with bank supervision and regulation already because in many countries central banks actually are the regulators and are the supervisors. And it's, it's also true for Germany, but you'll, you'll see what I mean in just a bit. Um, now with central banks, it's all about, usually it's all about monetary policy. Um, central banks conduct um, and uh, perform the monetary policy uh, in a country. Uh, and usually modern central banks serve the main purpose to secure price stability to keep inflation in check and subsequently, and this is usually a secondary goal of central banks, to also support the general economic policy. Um, we are quite aware, aware of this here in Germany because uh, Deutsche Bundesbank, which used to be uh, the only central bank in charge of our monetary policy, was famous for um, more or less only looking out uh, for inflation looking at inflation and keeping inflation um, in checks and only, um, how should I put it, um, very uh, infrequently and uh, not really um, willingly uh, supporting general economic policy. Some other federal, um, no, some other central banks, like for example, the Federal Reserve System in the United States, um, has a much uh, longer history of also looking out for um, the general stance of the economy, for supporting general economic policy of the federal government. But this has not been true for Deutsche Bundesbank. And it, it has changed a little bit uh, from the move from Deutsche Bundesbank as the sole central bank for Germany uh, to the European central banking system um, and the ECB. Now, depending on the legal form, central banks differ from other state institutions in terms of their tools uh, and their independence from other state institutions. There are some examples where actually the central banks are also stock companies, but most of the time uh, they are a part, they form part of the government, uh, usually the federal government or the central government. Um, and uh, in Germany, we have Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, and the European Central Bank, actually this has to be um, a capital B, of course, um, and uh, they form part of what we call the European System of Central Banks, the ESCB. Um, one is always inclined to think of the European Central Bank as uh, the sole um, central bank uh, within the European Union and within the Euro system. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. The Cent European Central Bank is the head institution of a system that is really the central bank, the central bank, if you could say so. Again, it's well, capital B, of course, here. Okay. Um, but let's, before uh, turning to the details of the European Central Bank and Deutsche Bundesbank, um, let's uh, go one step back and think about what a central bank really does. Um, how can you think about the jobs and the aims and goals of uh, basically any central bank in the world? Now, the tasks of a central bank can be identified by looking at the central bank's balance sheet on the asset and on the liability side. Now, on the asset side, um, let's make this experiment um, and let's, let's look at this example here. Now think, uh, imagine you were um, the government of a small island. Uh, you have now founded your own country. 
it's a small island and uh, you think about coming up with a central bank um, and uh, what could you do well first of all um, you want to make sure that uh, you have your own currency uh, you want currency you want a single currency on this little island uh, because otherwise people would simply be trading um, coconuts uh, food uh, some wood maybe on other things uh, so in very early days in modern know, modern history but in human history um, central banks were installed uh, in order for example to come up with a single currency now what one could do if this is the asset side and the uh, on the right hand side we have the liability side here one idea would be to issue currency to issue cash to print money and to give out money as a central bank now we call this currency we give it a name uh, island dollars um, and we issue one million in island dollars question for you is where would you insert the island dollars on the asset or on the liability side just use the chat window where would you enter the one million in island dollars we are now printing money asset or liability side anyone liability yes someone's saying asset no it's actually a liability we are printing money so we're giving out money and if you ever have the uh, luck to um, to see and to get uh, a British pound note, pound sterling, you will see that it says on the note um, a sentence like, I promise to pay the bearer of this note in the amount of, say, five pounds. So actually, this is a liability to the central bank. The central bank promises to pay you if you bring it, bring this note to the central bank, it promises you to pay um, this amount of money now we have 1 million in currency in let's say in notes now the balance sheet uh, is not in equilibrium we have 1 million um, island dollars in liabilities and we need assets so in very early days what did central banks do um, they actually accepted some other assets and this is quite clear here in very early days in human history uh, the central bank simply piled up gold uh, usually gold but you could also use foreign currencies and we could start by buying up gold and maybe some wood well, we could say one million in gold or let's say half a million in gold half a million in gold and let's say half a million in wood now yeah, we could start our asset side with wood gold and wood and this would be a very simple way for the central bank to issue a currency it will print out money one million in notes island dollars and it will buy up gold and wood and maybe foreign currencies us dollars uh, british pound euros etc and then it will have those gold and foreign currencies the currency reserve on the asset side and one million in notes on the liability side now what else will happen it could also be that uh, the on the asset side uh, the central bank now buys up nine million in uh, bonds we don't say which bonds but we are now buying not just one million in gold and wood but we also buy up nine million in bonds what we would then get is uh, now where can I I want to write on the liability side let's see um, and what we could do is uh, we've given out 1 million in currency notes but we could also give out 9 million in loans uh, or we've bought our bonds and we have loans from banks let's just put it here nine million loans um and this is what uh we could do next we can do open market transactions so we are buying up 
uh, we are buying up securities, we are purchasing securities, and we are again increasing the amount of capital, the amount of money that circulates within the um, economy. So if we now go to the asset side, we have the currency reserve. We have the refinancing of commercial banks. So the main and long term refinancing operations of the central bank, they appear on the asset side. We can also grant loans to the state. Uh, this is usually very restricted and is not uh, possible in many countries. And we have open market transactions, often marked Geschäfte. Open market transactions are purchasings of securities, usually bonds. Um, with which the central bank can try to control the money supply in the economy. If we then look at the liability side, um, we can issue banknotes. So this is the um, most important function, I guess, of a central bank, um, issuing uh, central bank notes. Uh, we have commercial banks deposits. This is, for example, the deposit facility. Um, banks can deposit short-term and long-term, usually short-term, cash with the central bank. And this is our commercial bank's deposits. And we also have state deposits and government deposits, meaning that all those accounts that are kept for the government, uh, they are kept with the central bank. And it's the same actually with uh, the state of Saxony or the German federal government. Um, the German federal government and most government um, entities in Germany have an account with Deutsche Bundesbank. So uh, just as you would, for example, go to Citibank or Targo Bank or a savings and loan association, the government keeps its bank accounts with the central bank. So we have cash management, management and account management for the public sector, that is for state and government agencies and organizations and institutions. Okay. Now, you can see this on the ECB balance sheet. This is the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. You have gold and gold claims. You have claims to foreign currencies. Um, and uh, these are actually also um, claims in foreign currencies, claims in euros, uh, securities in euros. Um, usually these are bonds. Um, and uh, on the liability side, we have banknotes, 76 billion euros and liabilities in euros and in foreign currencies and also some intra euro system liabilities and assets. Um, a quick question. Um, this is the balance sheet of the European Central Bank and it has a total assets of 174 billion euros in 2013. Do you think this is large or small? So this is 170 4 billion euros. Do you think this is large or small? Yes, rather small. Um, and this is surprising because this is the European Central Bank. It should be quite large, especially after years and years and almost a decade of uh, quantitative easing. Uh, a period where we've seen uh, an extreme uh, expansion of money supply. The question now is, how can you reconcile this uh, fact? Uh, you have quantitative easing, uh, the expansion of money supply on the one hand, but a very rather small uh, balance sheet of the European Central Bank on the other hand. Why is that? Does anyone know why this balance sheet is actually quite small? Any idea? To limit the amount of money in circulation? No, actually, um, there's a, a different reason based on the construction of the European system of central banks. What you're seeing here is the balance sheet of just the European Central Bank, the head institution of this European system of central banks. The operations are done by the individual central banks within the Euro system. So, for example, the, all the programs, also the pandemic program, PEP, um, the asset purchase programs, um, which form the quantitative easing strategy within the Euro system, all this, 
This is done by the central banks in each country. And they are, the central banks do this in the name and um, in, the, um, in coordination with the European Central Bank. So actually the European Central Bank uh, does not have all these assets on its balance sheet, but this is happening on, say, for example, the balance sheets of Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, Banque de France, etc., or Banco d'Italia. So it's actually by construction that you have within the European uh, Union and within the Euro system, you have all those national central banks that still exist and they are uh, they form part of the European system of central banks. Monetary policy is decided within the European Central Bank, but actually all the governors of the national central banks, they form um, the Council of the European Central Bank. Uh, this is where monetary policy is decided upon. And, uh, and then the national central banks will have to, um, well, engage in the operations necessary to uh, follow through on the policies set by the European Central Bank. So it's actually quite natural that the balance sheet of the ECB itself is rather small, but obviously if you want to call it inflated or if you call it uh, the uh, total assets of, you know, of all those other national central banks, they have increased dramatically over the last 10 years. This is the income statement. You can see, uh, actually this is again the um, uh, ECB income statement, uh, you can already see uh, that in this case here, uh, there's a, a strong increase, uh, and this is actually the one that is consolidated. You can see uh, the income, this is not correct, this is the asset and liabilities, uh, the balance sheet. Um, you can see here, this is uh, for 2018, the balance sheet. Um, and this looks uh, rather different. This is in Europe, uh, millions in euros. And the balance sheet in total, if you sum it all up, it's actually close to 4.6 trillion euros. So quite a contrast to the one of the European Central Bank itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, I told you that uh, it is not uh, just the European Central Bank. It is not equivalent to the euro system, but what we have in the European Union is the European system of central banks, the ESCB. The ESCB is not equal to the ECB and it's not equal to the euro system. The ES, uh, ESCB was introduced in 1999. It consists of the European Central Bank as the head institution and all national central banks within the European Union. So the ESCB is responsible for um, keeping and securing price stability, checking inflation. Its secondary objective is the support of economic policies. So combating uh, economic crisis like we've just seen. Um, as you've probably heard, we have a, a program called PEP, uh, which is meant to counter the adverse effects of the corona pandemic. And this is how the European system of central banks and obviously the ECB uh, is trying to support economic policy and fighting economic crises. Now, the ESCB has the following specific tasks. First of all, establishing and implementing a common monetary policy. Uh, then second of all, it's exchange rate policy, managing foreign exchange reserves and supervising credit institutions in the European Union and safeguarding financial system and uh, financial stability. This is probably uh, the point where it's quite obvious to see that uh, the supervision of credit institutions is done by the European Central Bank as part of the ESCB. And this is where Eurosystem and ESCB are uh, slightly different. So uh, countries that are not within the Eurosystem might still be and uh, do um, participate in the um, supervision of credit institutions by the ESCB. And last but not least, ensuring the functioning of payment transactions, especially providing money uh, and supplying money to um, households and uh, private persons within their European Union. Now, the ECB, as you probably know, is located in Frankfurt. It's governed directly under European Union law, and it has been uh, the common monetary authority of the member states of the European Monetary Union, as well as a component 
of the ESCB together with other national central banks since 1998. Now, in addition to the above mentioned objectives, the ECB also performs additional tasks, for example, uh, creating and uh, coming up with the central bank balance sheet, collecting statistical data, doing research. Um, the European Central Bank, as the head institution, has huge departments for, say, statistics, data analyses, uh, research, um, and so on, which obviously is also done in the national um, central banks, but um, the ECB is definitely um, here a front runner for the whole system. It is also responsible for supervising the systemically important banks in the euro system under the single banking supervisory mechanism. This is the SSM. Uh, this is part of the European Banking Union. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, in just a bit. And the ECB is governed by an executive board, the governing council, the general council and the supervisory board. And you can think of this uh, as follows. You have an executive board with so-called uh, executive directors. Um, for example, um, Isabel Schnabel, uh, Yves Mersch um, and uh, some other people together with uh, Christine Lagarde uh, form the executive board. They are um, the president um, and they are the executive directors that are in charge of the ECB's day-to-day -day business and day-to-day -day operations. We have the governing, governing council and the general council who are formed by members and usually the presidents of each uh, national central bank. So for example, the president of Deutsche Bundesbank he will not be in the executive board, but he will be part of the governing council. And this is where the members and the um, different uh, and all actually all uh, the presidents and governors of all the national central banks. This is where they will meet and dis uh, decide upon the general um, direction of monetary policy within the euro system and within the European Union. The executive board is responsible for um, for, um, 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 how can I say it? Um, uh, I know the German word, the German word is Ausführung. Um, um, they are responsible for uh, performing the task and being in charge of the uh, operations uh, that are meant um, to um, to fulfill uh, the outline, the settings uh, outlined by um, the governing council. Okay, so you can think of it, it like this: executive board, day-to-day -day operations, uh, governing council, general council, uh, the general strategic um, direction of the monetary policy. The European Central Bank has various instruments at its disposal to achieve its monetary policy objectives. For example, it can change interest rates. In effect. Uh, between the ECB and the commercial banks and specifically it can use the following instruments and this is important because usually when you just look at the media you would think that there is there is one interest rate and a central bank can simply change increase or decrease this particular interest rate and this is how a central bank uh, changes interest rates actually it's more complicated like that more complicated than that Specifically, it can use open market operations, standing facilities, currency interventions, reserve requirements, and the so-called OMT, uh, the outright monetary transactions. So let's talk about each of these in more detail. Now, open market policy, open market operations is main instrument of the ECB, but usually the main instruments of any central bank. What they do is the central bank uses uh, open market transactions to first of all control market interest rates to create cash and money and what it does is uh, you can buy uh, bonds and you can offer commercial banks the opportunity to pledge certain securities with the central bank for book money meaning that i could tell you if you are banks if you're commercial banks i could tell you you can leave your bonds, you can leave certain securities with me and I will give you cash. You can then use cash uh, to give out loans um, and you have to leave these securities, you have to pledge those as collateral with the central bank. 
Now, if I tell you, you can pledge your AAA rated bonds with me for cash. This is something different than say, for example, if I were to say, you can now also pledge double B, up to double B rated bonds with me as a central bank. So by changing uh, the conditions uh, for the open market operations, then um, this is um, one way to affect market interest rates. Uh, I can also go uh, to the market and buy up bonds myself. It's slightly different than pledging uh, certain securities. And uh, the most important open market transaction the ECB is using is the main refinancing instrument. This is called the main tender. And this is done in an auction procedure in which commercial banks may receive central bank money from the ECB in exchange for interest payments and securities. You have to pledge securities as a collateral. And since the financial crisis, the auction procedure is performed in a fixed rate tender uh, that is the main refinancing operations and currently it's at 0%. You have to pay 0% interest to get cash if you pledge some securities with the European Central Bank. Meaning that in the uh, fixed rate tender, uh, the interest rate is fixed and the banks name the, the desired money amounts. We also have the variable interest rate tender procedure in which this offered central bank money is allocated to the highest bidding commercial banks. Now, it used to be that you as a commercial bank could simply say, I want, I need um, 5 million and I'm willing to pay 5%. Someone else will say, I'm willing to pay 6%. And in this variable interest rate tender procedure, the money would go to the bank offering the best, the highest interest rate. Now, because interest rates are currently at 0%, the ECB after the financial crisis switched to a fixed rate tender procedure, meaning that the ECB only says, okay, we are offering money at 0%. And I, as a commercial bank could say, I need 5 million, I need 20 million, I need 100 million. And then the money is allocated um, across all those bids from commercial banks. We then have so-called standing facility. We have the same name in German, which is rather weird, Facilität. But facility means it's an opportunity, a possibility to do something. So facility is understood as the possibility of commercial banks to short term invest money or raise liquidity with a central bank as a counterparty. So you can simply leave cash overnight with the central bank or you can get overnight liquidity. And the ECB offers the so-called marginal lending facility as well as the so-called deposit facility. Now, the marginal lending facility gives commercial banks the opportunity to borrow money from the ECB at so-called marginal lending rate. Should currently be at 0.25%, better check um, at short notice. And if you are leaving cash, if you are depositing cash with the uh, central bank, uh, you can use the deposit facility, but in this case, if you are leaving unneeded liquidity overnight with the European Central Bank, you have to pay a negative interest rate of minus 0.4%, meaning that it will cost you if you deposit cash with the central banks. Next instrument is currency interventions. Now, central banks use currency interventions to influence, stabilize the exchange rate of their own currency with selected foreign currencies. I'll give you a very simple example. Um, actually, this is a very good example. Um, look at the Swiss National Bank, the SNB, Schweizerische Nationalbank. Uh, as you know, uh, Switzerland has its own currency, uh, the Swiss franc, uh, Schweizer Franken. And uh, Switzerland is interested and was interested, at, still is, but they cannot do it now. Uh, they were interested and are interested in keeping the exchange rate between, for example, the euro and the Swiss franc within a certain band, uh, within a certain interval. Uh, and how would you do this as a central bank? It's very simple. A foreign currency is nothing but, and an exchange rate is nothing but uh, a price of the foreign currency. Now, if you buy up the foreign currency, if you buy it up, you're decreasing supply, so price should go up of the foreign currency. If you sell uh, dollars, for example, uh, 
the supply of US dollars on the market increases and the price for US dollars relative to your currency should go down. So by buying and selling foreign currencies, you can influence and stabilize the exchange rate of your own currency. And the Swiss National Bank used to uh, do the following. It uh, said that uh, we would like to see the exchange rate uh, vary between, let's say, 1 euro per franc to 1 euro 20 per franc. At some point during the euro crisis, however, the euro got so cheap and the exchange rate dropped so heavily uh, that the Swiss, Swiss National Bank bought up uh, euros, but it made such a high, such a high loss that at some point it had to give up its promise uh, to stabilize the Swiss franc uh, exchange rate. Um, in German, we said the Nationalbank musste uh, den Wechselkurs freigeben. They had uh, um, they had to step back from their promise uh, of stabilizing the exchange rate, and this is when the uh, the exchange rate skyrocketed for a moment because now everyone knew, okay, the Swiss. National Bank will no longer stabilize the exchange rate and it can only go up now because the euro is so weak currently. Um, it is also the same case with the, the pound sterling exchange rate a couple of decades ago. Um, the Bank of England did the same thing and one famous uh, hedge fund manager, George Soros, uh, betted heavily against the pound. And at some point, uh, he was quite successful in his bet against the pound. The Bank of England had to do the same. And this is why George Soros is sometimes referred to as the man who broke the Bank of England, the man who robbed the Bank of England. He didn't break into the Bank of England literally, but uh, he forced the Bank of England to give up on its promise uh, to stabilize the exchange rate. We've seen with the balance sheet of the European Central Bank that they will keep a uh, currency reserve uh, currency reserves on its um, balance sheet. And why do they keep foreign um, currencies? Well, because they want to intervene and stabilize exchange rates uh, to uh, a level which the central bank believes to be healthy for the local currency and you know, for the local economy. Okay. Then next we have minimum reserves. We've seen this with the uh, multiplier model uh, and the uh, money multiplier in uh, banking theory. Now, minimum reserves are another instrument. Uh, they are a proportional bank deposits, uh, which have to be uh, mandatorily deposited as the central bank, uh, at the central bank as collateral. And the level is regularly determined as a percentage of the customer deposits of a bank. So if the central bank increases, the minimum reserve ratio. It will withdraw liquidity from commercial banks because they now can no longer give out as high loans and as many loans as before. So this results in a direct effect and direct impact on the creation of deposit money and the lending business of each bank. And this is uh, another instrument. Now with the European Central Bank, the minimum reserve ratio is 1%. In comparison, the Federal Reserve System has a minimum reserve ratio between 0 and 10%. And in the People's Republic of China, uh, this is almost close to 15%. Does anyone know why uh, it is so high in, in China? Any idea? any idea why is it rather low in the US for example or in the European Union and why is it so high in China minimum reserves do not only fulfill the purpose of uh, having having an effect on money creation they also serve a different purpose does anyone know which purpose Anyone, no one, okay. The minimum reserve ratio also serves the purpose um, to limit the losses and to limit the danger of a bank run. Um, and especially the loss of your deposits in case of a bank run. Uh, 
Now, if, for example, you are a depositor with a bank um, and you have a savings account, uh, a minimum reserve ratio of 15% would mean that the bank is limited from giving out all your deposits, which is the financing of the bank, as loans to other customers. Meaning that uh, the, the chances of all your money and all your deposits being lost is dramatically lower than the probability that, for example, uh, with a minimum reserve ratio of 1%, that you would recover your deposits. Does anyone know why uh, the reserve ratios are lower in the European Union and in the US than in China now? Because of something that uh, limits this risk uh, without affecting the minimum reserve ratio, because we in the European Union and the Federal Reserve System, we have deposit insurance schemes. We have so-called deposit insurance systems, Einlagensicherungssystem in German, deposit insurance, meaning that your, in, uh, your deposits are actually insured by a different system and you don't need such high minimum reserve ratios because the deposit should be safer for other reasons. Now, the European Central Bank determines the level of the reserve requirement based on the bank's liabilities that are subject to reserve requirements of the previous months. And in particular, these include the short-term deposits. We have long-term deposits that enter with a reserve ratio of 0%. And not included are liabilities to credit institutions that are holding minimum reserves themselves or liabilities against the European Central Bank or national central banks. And the actual minimum reserve is then determined by the daily volumes of the banks on their ECB account. Now, they all have accounts with the European Central Bank. And this is where um, you can check the deposits and liabilities. And this is where the European Central Bank then computes and calculates the reserve ratio and sees whether all banks uh, fulfill their minimum reserve ratio. Okay, so these are minimum reserves. And last but not least, we have outright monetary transactions. This is the famous OMT decision by the European Central Bank in 2012. And a precondition is that uh, we've seen a previous use of the rescue facilities of the ESM or EFSF. Uh, those are the, um, the European stability mechanism uh, that they have not been used so far. Uh, and does anyone know what the idea is? Now, it refers to the program for the purchase of short-term bonds of countries in the euro area, meaning that the central bank, the European Central Bank, guarantees to buy you, uh, to buy up short-term government bonds in the European uh, Union. What is so special about the outright monetary transactions decision? And what difference is there to um, the... Uh, asset purchase programs, uh, the quantitative easing program. Say this in German again. Um, was ist der Unterschied zwischen dem OMT-Beschluss und dem ganz normalen Anleihekaufprogramm der EZB? Does anyone know? No one. Famous three words. Whatever it takes. Uh, with the asset purchase program of the European Central Bank, uh, the European Central Bank um, disclosed how much um, money uh, they were creating and how much money they were basically printing and using to buy up bonds on the secondary market and later on on the primary market. Um, what is now the difference between the uh, asset pur purchasing program and the OMT decision? Really, no one knows this. In 2012, um, the um, then president uh, and uh, governor of the European Central Bank uh, Mario Draghi famously said that um, 
the European Central Bank will do whatever it takes to stabilize the euro system, meaning that in contrast to the asset purchase program, the outright monetary transactions decision means that if the rescue facilities of the stability mechanism have been used before by a member state, um, um, means that in this scenario, the European Central Bank would buy up government bonds in an unlimited amount until the euro system uh, was stable again. Now, this is completely different, even though the instrument might be the same and the outcome might be the same, the European Central Bank buying up assets, buying up uh, bonds, government bonds. The idea here is that if you tell the market, just like the Swiss National Bank, for example, if you signal to the market that the European Central Bank, which is a huge bank uh, with a huge balance sheet, um, if the European Central Bank tells market investors, we will do whatever it takes to reduce, say, for example, credit spreads. This will result in investors fearing that they will lose a lot of money by trying to bet against the European Central Bank and betting against some member states of the euro system. This is what the OMT decision uh, did. It definitely uh, helped uh, reducing credit spreads uh, from member states because suddenly everyone knew, OK, Greece and other South European states like Italy, Spain, they will not default and the European Central Bank will do, again, whatever it takes, uh, whatever it takes to save those countries and to save the euro. This is the OMT decision. Okay, very famous one. Now, another task of a central bank is to act as a lender of last resort in a financial crisis. Now, in general, the central bank can provide central bank money to any commercial bank to bridge an unexpected liquidity squeeze. In other words, it can bail out any commercial bank, uh, even an insurance company if it wishes to do. And the most important goal of the central bank here is to prevent a disorderly default, a bankruptcy that disrupts the financial system. Um, and this can even be the bankruptcy of one single financial institution. But perhaps, obviously with a typo here, where's my cursor here? Um, perhaps more importantly, uh, we don't want to simply prevent the default of a single financial institution, but we want to avoid the spillover of a liquidity crisis to other banks in the system. This is what we call contagion, contagion effects, that the problems from one bank spill over to the next one and so on, and then the whole financial system is in trouble. Problem here is that this creates a moral hazard problem. If you're a bank manager and you know that your bank is, well, let's call it too big to fail. If you know that you're too big to fail, meaning that the central bank or the government will always bail you out because you're too important for the financial system as a whole, you have a guarantee to survive. You can take up risk and you can, you can go berserk in the financial, crisis, uh, financial sector because you know you will be saved anyway, you will be bailed out. And this is a moral hazard problem because you've entered a social contract, meaning that you can operate as a bank, but you are checked uh, by financial supervisors and by regulators, uh, and you agree uh, to keep your risk taking within certain bounds. But if you know that you will be saved in any case, um, your shareholders and your managers will actually be interested in taking up more risk. And this is a moral hazard problem. Okay. Then let's turn to banking supervision and banking regulation. Now, in numerous countries, banking supervision is also part of the central bank's duties. For example, in the United States, the Federal Reserve System uh, has always been in charge and has assumed even more parts of banking supervision uh, and regulation. In Germany, it's threefold. We have the European Central Bank, Deutsche Bundesbank and the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, BaFin, Bundesamt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht in German. And these three, uh, they form the financial supervisors and regulators in Germany. Now, if you are interested in a more formal distinction between regulation and supervision, I would say that regulation is uh, meaning and means the setting of rules for the banking sector, 
if it's financial regulation, it's for the financial sector. And banking supervision is rather uh, the assertion of the rules and regulations and uh, enforcing those rules. This is supervision. Regulators are most of the time legislators. Those are parliaments who set rules, who set laws uh, that banks have to stick to, while banking supervision is, for example, BaFin who supervises financial institutions according to the regulations and laws set by parliament. Okay. Now, BaFin is Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht. They are located in Bonn and they have a large field office in Frankfurt. Uh, it's subject to the legal and technical supervision of the Federal Ministry of Finance, the BMF. Um, it used to be um, a set of several authorities, actually. We had uh, a federal banking supervisory authority, a banking, uh, a federal supervisory authority for the insurance sector and for securities trading. And they, um, they form, are now form um, the Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht, just one financial supervisory authority. Um, why do I end, or why did I insert this uh, info that they are subject to the legal and technical supervision of the Federal Ministry of Finance? This is a fundamental difference between Bundesbank and BaFin. Bundesbank is um, an independent. Uh, actually an independent uh, constitutional institution of Germany. Uh, it is, um, it's, it's laid out uh, in the German uh, basic law, in the Grundgesetz, um, but uh, it is not uh, liable to anyone. It's independent uh, and it should be independent. Uh, it's not so with BaFin. BaFin is actually um, um, it's basically a subsidiary, a, a department under the Federal Ministry of Finance. So it's a part of the executive and um, it is usually heavily influenced uh, by uh, the politics going on in the Federal Ministry of Finance. This is a complete, uh, this is completely different to Bundesbank, for example. Now, uh, the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority uh, is formed by um, a management that consists of an executive and I think it should still be five so-called executive directors, executive directoren. Uh, this was done uh, in reaction to more or less a scandal at BaFin. Um, and uh, after that, uh, it, this management board, this executive board was created with a president and five executive directors who on paper have the same rights and obligations. Uh, it's the supervisory authority for the whole financial sector in Germany, but it has to collaborate with Deutsche Bundesbank and the European Central Bank when it comes to banking. And um, the European Central Bank took over the supervision of systemically relevant banks in November 2014. And it works like this. Um, actually, the oper we call this operative... Um, uh, the operative Aufsicht. Uh, this is done by Deutsche Bundesbank. So they have auditors who will go to banks. BaFin's responsibility is, well, it's said to be all sovereign actions. Actually, uh, it's all legal actions. So if there is a problem, uh, if you need to, uh, to come up with more general rules that have to apl be applied at all banks, this is done by BaFin uh, with respect to uh, banking system. Uh, and uh, the day-to-day -day auditing is done by auditors by Deutsche Bundesbank. European Central Bank is responsible for the systemically relevant banks in cooperation and collaboration with Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, and uh, what is BaFin's sole responsibility? Does anyone know? Which area in the financial sector is more or less BaFin's sole responsibility. Any idea? The insurance sector. BaFin is uh, more or less autonomous when it comes to supervising and regulating the insurance and pension system and sector in Germany. It is not completely um, 
and solely responsible for security trading and for exchanges. Does anyone know uh, how it works in uh, um, the securities markets? No one, again. Um, supervision in securities trading works like this in Germany. BaFin is responsible for trading and the local state offices um, are responsible for the exchanges. Say this in German, probably a little bit easier. Um, es ist so, die Aufsicht über die Wertpapierbörsen äh, obliegt den jeweiligen Überwachungsstellen der Länder, ja, natürlich insbesondere in Hessen für Frankfurt. Äh, der Handel wiederum ist aber, äh, unterliegt der Aufsicht durch die BaFin. Uh, and you can, you can see this uh, with a rather sad example. Um, you might, some of you might remember that a couple of years ago, um, there was an attempted, or no, not attempted, actually it was rather unfortunately successful, terrorist attack on the um, football team of Borussia Dortmund. And the, uh, the criminal, the terrorist who did this, uh, he shorted uh, the stocks of Borussia Dortmund quite heavily because he's anticipated the stock price of Borussia Dortmund to go down as a result of this terrorist attack of this bombing. Um, and um, when uh, the police investigated this, um, the supervision of trading that is done on a regular basis by BaFin, they red flagged uh, this uh, extremely uh, normal uh, shorting of the stocks of Borussia Dortmund and they identified the person who shorted Borussia Dortmund stock and eventually this one, uh, this person was uh, the person who was responsible for the bombing. So this is what uh, BaFin does uh, in case of uh, stock trading. They supervise trading and trading behavior. Okay, uh, let me just get back to the slide. Okay. Now, the primary goal of regulation of banks is to secure financial market stability. Financial stability is the prime goal of any banking regulation. But in addition to the need for regulation uh, to be justified, uh, you need uh, some other arguments. For example, investor protection, consumer protection. Uh, you can justify bank regulation via the lack of transparency of banks, because usually you cannot see what types of loans banks give out. So there, for an external stakeholder, it's very, very difficult to assess the quality of the balance sheet, to assess the risk taking of a bank. And uh, we need more market transparency. And this is done, for example, by extended disclosure requirements, but also, also through supervision and regulation. And we have payment transactions and uh, we want uh, to make sure that payment transactions, payments within uh, the real economy are safe, are secure and possible at all moments in time. And this is because of the importance of the banking system and because of this importance of payment transactions to the real economy. This is how you can justify uh, the regulation of the banking sector. In Germany, banking regulation is done on two levels. First of all, we have legislation. We have the Kreditwesengesetz, the German Banking Act, Pfandbriefgesetz, Depotgesetz. So we have uh, formal laws enacted by the German Bundestag, uh, which have been in place for years. They are regularly amended and changed uh, to keep regulation up to date. And on the other hand, we have executive branch that have also enacted so-called executive orders or statutory orders. What is this? Well, um, in the German legal system, probably it's the same in many other countries, um, we have a system in which a parliament will enact a law and this law um, allows the executive branch um, to do certain things. And uh, the executive branch can then enact so-called executive orders or statutory laws and statutory orders that are within the boundaries set out in the law, for example, in the Kreditwesengesetz, uh, and which then specify the things that the Bundestag uh, Parliament will 
not go into detail with. So we could, for example, take the most famous example for an executive and statutory order that is based on a law that is the German uh, traffic law and the German traffic um, <laughs> statutory order. Uh, in German, it's uh, Straßenverkehrsgesetz uh, and Straßenverkehrsordnung. In the statutory order, in the executive orders, uh, all the details are laid out. For example, how do all the different traffic signs and traffic signals look like? German Parliament didn't and German Bundestag didn't want uh, to talk about and set the rules uh, talking about all the different traffic signs. They wanted to make sure that the German Federal Ministry of Traffic and Transportation is allowed to set the uniform rules for German streets and highways, etc. Uh, throughout all of Germany. So this is the uh, traffic law enacted by Parliament and it um, enforces and it allows the executive branch to come up with traffic signs. And it's actually the same here. For example, we have the solvency regulation. Solvabilitätsverordnung, the V at the end, signals that this is an executive order. This is not a, a law. If you ever see a G at the end of such an abbreviation, this is a formal law enacted by Parliament. Whereas if you see a V, this is a statutory order, for example, in this case, enacted by the Federal Ministry of Finance. Uh, and if you ever see a, a parking uh, space, uh, it, you might see something like uh, uh, Es gilt die Straßenverkehrsordnung. Meaning that on this private parking space, uh, you have to stick to the rules set out in the German traffic statutory order. Meaning that if you see a traffic sign, even though it's a private street, uh, you should stick to the rules that are also applicable and have to be abided by on official state roads. Yeah? Uh, and in this case, this is uh, Ordnung. And this is the same V for Verordnung. So this is Solvabilitätsverordnung. Um, we have these, for example, for the solvency regulation um, for banks. We ha also have minimum requirements on risk management, the MA risk. And this actually was a newsletter of BaFin. This is tricky because this is not formal legislation and not even a statutory order, but this is uh, a newsletter basically by BaFin telling banks that uh, the KWG, the Kreditwesengesetz, um, allows us and gives us the right uh, to supervise banks. And within this uh, newsletter, uh, we are now telling banks what we think is prudent uh, risk management and what we would consider a minimum requirement on risk management. So even though this is not a formal piece of legislation, you know that if BaFin is the official supervisor for banks in Germany, you have to stick to the rules BaFin has set out. And you can see this every now and then that BaFin publishes uh, white papers uh, that are not formal legislation, of course, but these are official documents by the executive branch and banks will stick to this. And last but not least, we also have the large exposure regulation, the Millionenkreditverordnung, meaning that, uh, and this includes uh, some uh, the regulation that uh, if you're a bank and if you give out very large loans, you have to report those large loans to Deutsche Bundesbank uh, so that Deutsche Bundesbank can keep track of huge exposures uh, to certain uh, companies within the banking system in case of a financial crisis. This is all set out in uh, paragraph 6, section 2 of the German Banking Act. This is the English translation, of course. BaFin shall counteract undesirable developments in the lending and financial services sector, which may endanger the safety of the assets entrusted to institutions, impair the proper conduct of banking business, or provision of financial services or entail major disadvantages for the economy as a whole. So it shall counteract undesirable developments. Very, very general. Um, and in section three, it is said that BaFin may issue orders to institutions and their senior managers that are appropriate and necessary, uh, notwendig und geeignet to prevent or stop violations of the regulatory provisions or to prevent or overcome 
undesirable developments at an institution which could endanger the safety of the assets entrusted to the institution and so on and so on and financial security and financial stability. In exercising its function, Section 4, Bafin shall duly consider the potential impact of its decisions on the stability of the financial system in the European Economic Association states concerned. Meaning that there is also an economic, uh, no, there's also a European perspective that Bafin has to take. Paragraph 7, this concerns banking supervision. Bafin and Deutsche Bundesbank will cooperate as stipulated in this act. Without prejudice to further legal provisions, this cooperation encompasses the ongoing die fortlaufende Überwachung, the ongoing supervision of institutions by Deutsche Bundesbank, meaning that day-to-day -day supervision, ongoing supervision is done by Deutsche Bundesbank. BaFin will only come in if there's something going wrong, if they have to step in, if there are some problems, and for general rules that Deutsche Bundesbank will stick to. So ongoing supervision notably entails evaluating the documentation submitted by institutions, audit reports pursuant to period of 26, and annual financial statements, as well as performing and uh, evaluating on-site inspections, that is, well, inspections and audits in the banks on-site, with a view to assessing institutions' capital adequacy and risk management procedures, as well as appraising inspection findings. As a rule, Deutsche Bundesbank's ongoing supervision is performed by its regional offices. Regional office is a translation of the German Hauptverwaltung, that's the official name. We actually do have one Hauptverwaltung here in Leipzig as well. This is the one responsible for Saxony and Thuringia. So that's one Hauptverwaltung of Deutsche Bundesbank. Now, banking supervision. Um, supervisors will regularly use the following instruments. Uh, this is exemplified by the German Banking Act, but actually these are instruments that are available for almost all banking supervisors in the world. First of all, capital requirements, capital requirements, capital requirements set out in paragraph 10, the German Banking Act, meaning that, oh, I'll come back to this later, but it means that you have to set minimum capital ratios and banks need to keep a certain amount of equity on their balance sheet. Second, assessing institutions' liquidity, meaning that you need to check the liquidity of the banks at any point in time. And if they seem to be illiquid, you have to step in as a supervisor. You have to authorize or forbid banks from doing some business operations and uh, from doing business in some countries, in some instruments, etc. Uh, you monitor bank risks and individual transactions. That is done, for example, by the Millionenkreditnehmerverordnung. Um, and you can issue warnings, fines, you can prohibit certain business, you can withdraw licenses, etc. So you can simply um, close down one um, bank if you want to. Okay, so that's banking supervision and regulation in a nutshell. We'll come back to this later in chapter seven. Let's talk a little bit about the US American banking system. Now, in... Um, see no this is yeah um we want to talk a little bit about um some foreign banking systems and uh, we'll come back to the uk and the japanese system maybe at the very end of this lecture but here i, I want to look at the u.s american banking system from the perspective of banking supervision and regulation after that, we'll deal with supranational banks like the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, the IMF, etc. Uh, the reason why the US American banking system is so very important is because it's the largest banking sector in the world. It is hugely important for doing research and it's also a hugely important uh, experimental field uh, for performing research. Uh, and trying to assess the effect of certain uh, acts in supervision um, and some uh, uh, regulatory actions, uh, and you can almost always study this uh, within the European, no, within the U.S. system. Okay. Now, as already described, um, the U.S. system has seen a huge number of structural reforms over the past decades. Originally, it was designed as a universal banking system, meaning that banks were allowed to operate 
both commercial and investment banking. It was then transformed into a separate banking system by the famous Glass-Steagall Act. I think it lacks an A here, Steagall Act. Um, and the Glass-Steagall Act after the Great Depression uh, meant that banks had to decide, do they want to be an investment bank or do they want to be a commercial bank? During the Clinton administration, we had the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, the GLBA, the Graham-Leach, I think this is how it's written, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act uh, of 1999. And with it came some decisive regulations for the separate banking system because they were reversed and which again meant that uh, banks could now operate both commercial and investment banking. This is when um, the size of US banks suddenly exploded because all those large banks that were already large, they then uh, consolidated and bought up commercial and investment banks. And this is when, for example, Bank of America um, and uh, Citigroup uh, and some other banks uh, became extremely large. Now, nowadays it's rather difficult to say it's a, a purely universal or a separate banking system. For example, back in 2006, uh, the German textbook of Hartmann, Wendels, Finks and Weber still spoke of a separate banking system. Uh, it's more complicated than this. Um, so in the US we have commercial banks, we have so-called thrift institutions, and we have investment banks, brokers, dealers and other non-banks. And within the thrift institutions we have mutual savings banks, credit unions, and savings and loan associations. Basically very similar to the US, uh, German system uh, as in mutual banks, credit unions and savings and loan associations. Now commercial banks, they are the prime example of classical commercial private banks with deposit and lending business. However, we also have very large big commercial banks, uh, Citigroup, Bank of America, these are the largest ones. Over the 80s, the interaction of bad lending, missing diversification and a poor economic system uh, situation led to the bankruptcy of many commercial banks. So the number has been decreasing and the remaining banks have consolidated, merged all over the place. Um, and this has led to uh, Bank of America and, for example, Citigroup being such large banks nowadays. The thrift institutions, which in German, the best problem, uh, Translation would probably be Spar und Darlehenskassen, are the second big group of banks. Uh, they include mutual savings banks. We can find those mainly in New England, uh, the savings and loan associations, as well as credit unions. And similar to the German savings banks and cooperative banks, they are usually, not always, but usually, in the possession of the depositors or clients and they primarily pursue the promotion of lending and saving as business goal and operate on a much smaller scale and at a very local level. If you have ever driven through the United States, you have seen, you've probably seen many, many banks and some of them which only operate one branch. It might be that you have some banks which only operate one branch, have five employees and a very, very small balance sheet. These are credit union savings and loan associations. They only operate on a very local level, um, but they still survive to some extent. Now, with the savings and loan associations, uh, we have to talk about the savings and loan crisis. Uh, the savings and loan crisis between 86 and 95 was a huge financial crisis before the financial crisis came in 2008, 2009. And during this SNL crisis, approximately 1,000 of the 3,000 savings banks went bankrupt. Problem was that we had a, a huge deregulation by the Depository Institution Deregulation and Monetary Control Act, and it permitted those savings and loan associations to offer further products, but it didn't see any change in the regulation. We then had a tax reform uh, that eliminated tax rebates for real estate investments, and the result was that the real estate values and the housing prices dropped and led to depreciations and huge write-offs with savings banks. And then the rise in base rates uh, to flight inflation by the Federal Reserve System led to an increase in refinancing costs. And over this period of 10 years, because most of these savings and loan associations didn't really were diversified. They were very local, only had given out loans in their uh, locality. 
uh, meant that some of them uh, went bankrupt. It was a process of almost two, uh, 10 years and it was the financial crisis uh, 10, 13, 15 years later on a smaller scale. But you can see the similarities. Deregulation, uh, a depreciation of housing prices, an increase in central bank uh, interest rates uh, and a lack of diversification. And this caused almost one third of the SNL uh, sector to go bankrupt in the US. Approximately 160 billion US dollars uh, were lost. And what followed was uh, we got the OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision for supervising those uh, SNLs. We had the Savings Association Insurance Fund for deposit insurance and the Resolution Trust Corporation for resolving and uh, um, resolution of these troubled SNL institutions. We then have investment banks. Uh, prime examples are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs as well, the largest investment bank in the world. We also have securities brokers, securities dealers, uh, and what they do is quite clear. They uh, brokers live on the commissions of their transactions. Dealers uh, earn turnovers while the bid are spread um, and they uh, offer their investment banking services to their clients. We also have non-banks and near banks. Those are pension funds, mutual funds, money market funds that share some similarities with banks. They also offer financial services, but they are sometimes not regulated as banks. So this is why we call them near banks. So less regulation, but uh, bank-like uh, business operations. On a side note, um, in the last two or three decades, we've seen the emergence of a sector uh, we would now consider shadow banking. What is a shadow bank? A shadow bank is any financial institution or any company that offers banking services, like for example, uh, the intermediation of loans, but they do not own a banking license and they are not supervised as a bank. This is a problem and this caused a huge problem during the financial crisis because these shadow banks were suddenly found uh, to be systemically relevant without ever being supervised or falling under any banking regulation. And supervisors and regulators have tried uh, to close down this shadow banking sector by enforcing uh, regulations on those companies as well, even though they previously were not considered to be banks. And especially money market funds were highly uh, responsible in this respect that they acted as shadow banks during the financial crisis. So some characteristics, usually hedge funds, money market funds, ETFs, private equity funds. In general, they do not finance themselves through deposits because if they had deposits, they would immediately be considered a bank. But uh, because they don't have deposits, they are usually not subject to the usual regulation of banks. You have so-called regulatory arbitrage, meaning that uh, these companies can exploit shortcomings in regulation and they have cheaper financing because they ha don't have capital requirements, for example, and they can exploit uh, the, um, um, the differential uh, regulation of some institutions in comparison to others. And often shadow banks were subsidiaries of banks, but their business is conducted outside the parent company's balance sheet. So they are off balance sheet. And this meant that they were not uh, on that regulators and supervisors were not aware of the risk that were in the shadow bank subsidiaries of large banking corporations. Business model, very often granting loans and investments in securities, financing via short-term asset-backed security or repo transactions, so they have no access to central bank money. They cannot easily be bailed out. And we have a lack of transparency, inadequate regulation, excessive leverage, high degree of interdependence with other banks. So the, uh, the recipe for disaster, and this was found out during the financial crisis. Now, there's a general distinction in the United States between state chartered and federally chartered commercial banks. And now with state banks, they are authorized and supervised by a state, whereas national banks or federal savings banks, they are authorized and supervised by the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And then it gets a little bit tricky. State banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System, 
are supervised by the Federal Reserve Board. The state banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve are supervised by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, even though the name suggests that this is just an insurance corporation. So again, state banks, Federal Reserve, Fed, state banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve, FDIC. They are all controlled and supervised by state officials and by state institutions. So this is the so-called and famous dual banking system. You have supervision at both the state, for example, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, at the state level, but also additionally by one federal authority, being the Federal Reserve or the FDIC. Now, what is the Federal Reserve System? The Federal Reserve System is the central banking system of the US, and the Federal Reserve System consists of 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks that are located in all the 12 federal uh, circuits, um, and additionally, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, DC. The member banks, the national banks, those are at the federal level, they must be members, and state members can be members. We've seen those, and if they are, they are also uh, supervised by the Federal Reserve System. In, in addition to its functions as a central bank, it supervises and regulates its member banks, and this is approximately one third of all commercial banks in the United States. Now, this is the federal, these are the Federal Reserve districts, and as you can see, it has nothing to do with um, the state itself. We have 12 Federal Reserve Banks. Uh, the first one is in Boston. The second one is in New York City. The third one is, I think, in Pennsylvania. Um, then we have the fourth one in Cleveland. The fifth one in... Richmond, uh, Atlanta, and so on and so on, and one in San Francisco and one in Chicago. So as you can see, the Federal Reserve Banks are located all across the United States, and they are responsible for these Federal Reserve Districts. Uh, so they are responsible for the banks located in these districts. Um, it is, however, a fact that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is by far the most important one. Why? Because it is located and responsible for the banks on Wall Street. Uh, and New York is uh, the financial hub in the United States. So that's um, the Federal Reserve System. The OCC is the supervisory and regulatory authority for all national banks and thrift institutions. And the FDIC is the National Deposit Insurance Authority of the US. And in the event of bankruptcy, the deposits of the customers of the member banks are secured by the FDIC. In addition, the FDIC supervises those state banks that are not member of the Fed system. The credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration, the NCUA. Rather complicated. It's very simple when it comes to stock trading and stock exchanges. Investment banks, stock exchange, uh, and investment banking and stock exchange and trading, they are supervised by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, full stop. So that's quite easy. Okay, now last but not least, let's talk a little bit about the supranational banks. Now we've seen the national banks, we have seen the central banks, but we also have a couple of supranational banks, most notably the IMF, which is in fact not really a bank, but it's often considered to be a bank. Um, we have the World Bank, uh, which is more than one bank, so it's the World Bank Group. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, in Basel, and the European Investment Bank. So what are these? The World Bank is actually five banks. It's the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IDA, the IFC, the MIGA and the ICSID. So these five banks, uh, they are legally independent organizations, but in practice, they are all under one roof. It's usually the first one, the IBRD, which is considered to be the World Bank. Uh, and its goal is development aid in less developed member states of the United Nations through counseling, financial assistance, etc. So the World Bank is in development uh, aid uh, and working in development aid. 
it's meant to finance development aid in developing countries and less developed members of the UN. They do not provide transfer payments, so it's not just cash handouts, but they give out loans. Uh, so IBRD, members hold shares of capital in relation to their economic strength, can raise capital itself and grant development aid loans. I don't want to go into the details of these five banks. You can see that they have di slightly different responsibilities. Uh, they give out loans. For example, here the loans are granted interest fee or strongly discounted, but this one cannot raise capital of its own. They also have their own research uh, department and it's about uh, um, helping um, economic growth in less developed countries around the world. So that's the World Bank. The IMF, in contrast, has the promotion of international cooperation in monetary policy, world trade and stabilization of exchange rates at its main goal. So it's with the IMF, it's about exchange rates, extending world trade and fostering world trade, lowering tariffs, lowering uh, trade barriers and promoting international cooperation within monetary policy. So the IMF can in fact act as a lender of last resort for countries like Argentina, uh, Greece. This is why the IMF was uh, involved in saving Greece during the Euro crisis. It had nothing to do with World Bank because Greece is not a, not a developing country, but the IMF uh, cooperated with the European Union, the European Central Bank and the Euro system to help Greece come out of its uh, public debt. The voting rights, which are called special drawing rights uh, and payment obligations, they are determined by a distribution formula in the United Nations. And criticism, as you've probably heard a lot, is that uh, the credit and loans that are granted by the IMF, they only come in connection with so-called structural adjustment programs, meaning that you only get help from the IMF if you agree to change something in your country. And this is when IMF uh, advisors uh, and experts will come to your country and they will tell government what to change. And this is a problem because the people in these countries that are affected by the IMF usually say, well, we didn't elect the, exper the experts from the IMF. So if experts come uh, to Greece with a structural adjustment program telling that they have to cut their, um, their pensions and they have to smaller, uh, small, uh, decrease their pension system. Uh, this is not legitimized democratically because no one voted for those experts from the IMF. Uh, so this is one frequent uh, critique of the IMF. Next, we have the Bank for International Settlements. The Bank for International Settlement was founded, in fact, uh, to supervise uh, the uh, reparation payments of Germany after the First World War but it is now considered to be the bank of central banks and a forum uh, for the uh, cooperation of central banks in all matters of financial markets, financial stability, economic policy. So most of the world's central banks are members of the Bank for International Settlement. Uh, they have interest, uh, ownership interest in the BIS. And this is also where famous, um, uh, famous, uh, associations uh, for the promotion of financial market stability are located. For example, the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS, the only worldwide global forum for, inter for insurance supervisors where global uh, um, insurance supervisors meet to discuss common uh, rules for insurance supervision. Also, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. All these are part of the BIS. And uh, it is interesting, the BIS is prohibited from accepting bills of exchange and lending to governments. So it's not really a bank in this sense, but it's rather uh, an association where central bankers can meet uh, and where some international standards are set uh, by central bankers and of course by the colleagues working at the BIS in Basel. The BIS is located in Basel, Switzerland. And last but not least, we have the European Investment Bank. It is a special financial institution meant uh, to uh, contribute um, to the uh, development of a single market in the interest of the European Union. That is um, supporting via lending, via loans, um, the transnational highways, 
uh, anything that connects the countries within the European Union. So the European Investment Bank is meant to give out not developing aid, but uh, subsidized loans to projects that are important uh, for improving the intra-European economic and social cohesion. Uh, so many times when you see uh, a new uh, highway, a new motorway being built through several countries in the European Union or connecting uh, transportation routes, this is done with the help of the European Investment Bank via subsidized loans. Okay. Now, this is our chapter on central banking and uh, especially supervision and uh, regulation. Do you have any questions? Any questions on central banks, European Central Bank, the US system uh, with the FDIC, the OCC, the OTS? Uh, we'll come back to this later on. Um, but if you don't have any questions and if I uh, see it correctly in the chat window, no one is writing a question. So if you have no questions, uh, then we can stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and see you next week.